Jane Lynn is an ecological site specialist for NRCS in Richfield, Utah. His job is to classify and describe rangelands on the national parks in southern Utah and on private and public lands throughout the state. His work provides land managers with an ecological basis for making land management decisions using the best information available. Welcome, Jane. All right. Thank you, Tom. I guess I failed to include in my bio that I started my range career working with Tom and Tom, specifically for Tom Monaco and the Forge and Range Research Lab in Logan. And uh, I guess that's partly uh, where this particular project I'm going to talk about today kind of got um, its start was with this relationship that we had um, when I, well, I don't know, about eight, six, seven, eight years ago when I was an undergraduate student. Well, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit today about a project uh, that, that I think is a good example of how ecological site classification can help us to can help provide a context to improve our interpretation of the data and information that we have. Um, I, uh, I was under the impression that this um, session started at 1.15, so I was, I was hoping that my talk would be shortened to uh, 15 minutes, but looking down at the schedule, it looks like I got until 2 o'clock. So, uh, <coughs> I should have plenty of material though. So um, the project kind of came together as a cooperation between the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, the ARS Forge Range Research Lab, and the NRCS in Utah. And the leaders from those um, three groups in this effort are Danny Summers, who's here today, Jason Vernon, and Kevin Gunnell, who deserve a lot of credit for um, kind of taking up the reins on this. And then uh, from the Forage and Range Research Lab, Tom Monaco has really um, led the effort in terms of um, kind of the vision of what we could do with the data. And they, uh, they were gracious enough to bring me in and uh, Shane Green, who's our state range con in Utah, to, to, uh, to kind of provide our uh, expertise on ecological sites in the area and how we could classify the land um, within that robust framework. So on the range trend, um, this project essentially uh, is intended to make some sense, not just make sense, but to interpret the range trend um, long-term monitoring data set that the Utah Division of Wildlife has been collecting since 1982. And on their uh, website, there are a couple of quotes kind of provide uh, premises for this project. And the first quote says, the health and vigor of big game populations are closely correlated to the quality and quantity of forage in key areas. Right? And so the data set, the way that the DWR has kind of addressed this notion is, in 19, since 1982, they've been establishing these long-term range trend monitoring plots. And that, right now there's 559, and they're um, visited every five years on a rotating basis. Um, so they do one-fifth of the state each year. <clears throat> the second quote, and the one that we really are, are focusing on in this um, project, says range trend data are used by wildlife biologists and other managers for habitat improvement planning purposes. But the question is, with that premise, how is that done? What is the mechanism or vehicle that we use to interpret that data in a way that's useful to habitat improvement planning and that process? And so our overall question is how do we inter interpret this huge and awesome data set? And so we have uh, a good team with varied strengths. And uh, 
let's just look at the data a little bit at what we've got. So on these 559 plots, we have some pretty common um, plant, community, plant community metrics to characterize the site that are listed there. There's also pellet counts and repeat photography in the four uh, cardinal directions each five years. And if you'll notice, really the, the, the most uh, important part of this slide is the distribution of these range trend sites. There are these red dots. It's not very bright on the projector. Hopefully you can kind of see some patterns. Notice, you know, in, in Utah we have a few large kind of regions. The Great Basin region, and they're separated by these yellowish green colored lines. Um, and these are the NLRAs, the major land resource areas of NRCS. So we have the Great Basin area in, uh, in western Utah, the Wasatch Mountains and the Uinta Mountains area, kind of the Colorado Plateau, and then kind of the Uinta Basin has, has a few kind of subsections. There's a, a branch here of the Rocky Mountains region that fingers into the state. Notice that the range trend study plots, they kind of skirt the mountains. You know, there's not really much out here. There's not a whole lot out here. There's a few around the Henry Mountains down in uh, my neck of the woods. But <clears throat> the range trend study sites are targeted. They're for wildlife management purposes. And so they're focused on the areas that are considered to be limiting to wildlife. In most cases, that's winter range. So you see a lot on the foothills. But in some cases, there's some high mountain study sites when the summer range is deemed to be a limiting factor. And there are a few scattered out in uh, more in valleys, especially down here in southern Utah where they winter out on some of these flats. <coughs> so as you can imagine, with that many data points spread across an entire large state like Utah, there's a lot of variability um, in the plots spatially. So at the highest elevations, you know, we have aspen sites and um, on deep soils. And on some of the shallow soils, we have these curly mahogany sites, maybe a little lower elevations. Or in other areas, we have mountain big sage sites, bitter brush sites, and at lower elevations, even cliff rose sites, Wyoming big sage brush sites, all the way down to desert shrub type communities. And this is just kind of a representation of what, what there is. And there are more. There's more variation than this. This kind of runs the spectrum. <clears throat> now consider within each of those types, we have data spanning decades every five years or so. In some cases like this, it went six. We can live with that. Um, this is one site over, what's that, 28 years, 29 years. And you can see, you know, it's kind of got this sagebrush, bunch grass community. There's the bunch grasses are easier to see here, but there's some juniper encroachment. And then in 2000, you know, it was kind of into this. Is it a juniper state, or is it, uh, or is it still kind of got potential to be in in a bunch grass sagebrush state? You can see there was a treatment, a chaining, I believe. And do you know, Dan? Mastication, Mastication treatment. And uh, now it's back into this nice kind of bunch grass in the, in the foreground. And it's hard to see on this, but these are, there's some sagebrush plants still kind of in that background scattered through. So maybe this was kind of an, an at-risk phase, which has been discussed today. And it was treated in a timely enough way to um, kind of maintain some of those ecological functions before it crossed a threshold. And now, you know, the... the, the grass and the shrubs have that chance to kind of maintain the health and resilience of the, of the site. So we have spatial variability and then within kind of ecological site classifications we have temporal variability. Now how do we interpret all of that complexity? Well um, the perceived needs of the group and kind of within the broad goal of kind of the, our division of wildlife resources came out to be these. We want to use the range trend data to evaluate the habitat in relation to wildlife. And I already kind of talked about that. That's, that's, that's the premise of all this data collection. But also we want to use it to explain and compare diverse communities on a landscape scale. 
and uh, hopefully be able to extrapolate what we gain from the range trend sites in a reasonable way that we can understand similar areas that don't happen to have a range trend plot on them. We want to exchange, uh, explain changes in the plant and animal communities over time and um, if possible determine the transition mechanisms between those plant community types. Specifically as they relate to the improvement or deterioration of wildlife habitat and what we can do um, to maintain and improve the quality and quantity of our wildlife habitat. So these are the perceived needs kind of of the project and what we uh, hope to address. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, as we thought about this as a group, um, we figured that that the, that the ecological site framework was a perfect fit and it was robust enough to account for all the variability um, in one way or another in this data set in a way that we could interpret it and explain it and relate it back to our objectives. And so um, we realized not all range trend areas have the same potential and therefore um, we need a potential base classification system. So ecological sites are just that. The, the power of ecological sites is that you can use this classification system to compare apples to apples. And what I mean by that is ecological site classifications are um, different from other community associations and habitat um, types in that they classify land based on the potential of the land, not on the current plant uh, species or community, which can vary over time. And so in order to do that, they're based primarily on the soils, you know, predominant soil, physical and chemical features, as well as climate um, and weather patterns and landscape position. So these abiotic factors um, combine and interact with those plants. And uh, I really like to think about ecological sites as the product of centuries of feedbacks between the the soil resource and the plant um, or biotic inputs to that soil and those feedbacks which have been mentioned a little bit today, all within the context of a climate, the soil environment feeding back to the plants, feeding back to the soils until you actually have a site that developed <clears throat> over centuries with these plants and these soils. Um, and we call that um, the reference condition or the reference state because that's that's what really drove the processes for hundreds of thousands of years on these sites. So we used the reference state to look and see how these sites functioned and how they developed. Um, and we'll get into that more I guess with state transition models. Um, and so, like, so the definition of ecological sites then are distinctive type, types of land with these two characteristics. One, the ability to produce distinctive kinds and amounts of vegetation <clears throat> that differ from other sites and that have a similar response to disturbance. Or maybe I should say, or they have a similar response to disturbance. You may have two plant communities in the reference state of two similar ecological sites. One might have a shallow soil, one might have a deep soil, and their response to disturbance could be different. So the reference communities are similar, but over time, their trajectories are different. And so these are the two things that we look at to classify land and ecological sites. And they provide an, an ideal framework uh, for state and transition modeling, modeling because of um, this design or this classification design. <clears throat> As a really brief overview for those of you who haven't seen this before, Ecological sites are the basic unit, the fundamental unit of a broader land classification hierarchy in the United States. Um, similar to the, the eco-region hierarchy of Forest Service and, and a lot of these lines parallel what they have. The largest unit being land resource region as you can see in this excerpt uh, from the United States, the larger U.S. map, we have the Rocky Mountains uh, land resource region. Within that there's this green area. And that green area in Utah uh, is the Wasatch Mountains and the Uinta Mountains, and that is the major land resource area, NLRA. 
that's what we call it. And then within that, there's these red splotches, and this is a pretty extensive ecological site. And you can see that it kind of occurs throughout the MLRA, not necessarily all in one continuous pattern, but wherever the combination of soils, climate, and landform coincide to produce those plant community characteristics. <clears throat> Um, and so in this case, you know, we have this ecological site, which is the, I think, the mountain, low mountain, big sagebrush site. This is the site number and how it relates to the hierarchy, et cetera. So it's a whole system. I won't get into all the details, but I'd like to, to share this slide because even though it's not from uh, the Great Basin, which most of us are familiar with, it's from the Colorado Plateau where I've been doing a lot of my work. And uh, I work in the national parks for the most part, um, and as I walk through this part of the northern end of Capitol Reef National Park, I walk through the sandy loam bottom with alkali you know, um, soil chemistry and alkali sacatone and a little bit of greasewood, but mostly alkali sacatone dominated these bottoms. I went up on the hill. It's shallow, loamy, mixed parent materials, low total production, but dominated by salina wild rye. Then I got up on the ridge, and I'm heading on this long soil transect that cuts across this whole landscape. And it's just shallow loam soil with lots of stones, and it's pinning and juniper dominated with bigelow sage and a variety of other species. And I'm making notes of this as I go over. I go down the hill, and I'm in another sandy bottom. It looks just like this. When I go up over another hill, it looks just like this. And I cross another ridge and go down into another sandy bottom, and that pattern repeats itself. And that's the strength of ecological site concepts. It's an example of how sometimes at broader scales than what we're going to walk in a day, landscapes repeat themselves within these larger climatically driven regions. And so that's kind of generally the approach of how we classify lands by ecological sites. And 